80% of Irish households now own a smart speaker, providing the perfect messaging platform for your business. But is your business reaching them? Don't get left behind. Come to Voice First Dublin, a free event at the Dean Hotel. You can even choose the date, Wednesday 12th or Thursday 13th of February from 12.30. Voice First Dublin. It's just 90 minutes out of your day, but it could give your business years of benefits. Reserve your free tickets now. Go to newstalk.com slash voice. Hi, Theresa Mannion here with a road safety alert for bad weather. Your vehicle may be blown off course in strong winds, so slow down. Watch out too for vehicles and cyclists veering across the road and fallen debris like branches. Visit rsa.ie from the Road Safety Authority. Off the ball. This is News Talk. And you're very welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five o'clock. 53106 is the number for your text messages, your predictions ahead of Ireland against Wales at 2.15. We're streaming live now as well. You can get in touch with us on the Off the Ball social channels on Twitter, at Off the Ball, on YouTube, on Facebook. And you can also listen on the Go Loud app. Ahead of Ireland Six Nations match against Wales, delighted to be joined live from the Aviva Stadium to talk rugby over the next hour with the former Munster and Leicester player Johnny Murphy and the rugby correspondent of the Irish Independent, Rory O'Connor. Good afternoon, guys. Hey, John. Hey, John. How are you doing? Has Storm Kira arrived yet, lads? No. No, <laughs> no not at all. I'm a thermos on and all expecting it, but no. Looking at, the, skies. looking at the flags, it's pretty blustery, but it's uh, it's very dry and it's sunny, so it's looking it's looking pretty good. Yeah. I'm hearing Rebel Rebel in the background there as well, which is always a good sign. Uh, Scotland against England as well at 4.45 in Murrayfield in the Calcutta Cup clash. France playing Italy tomorrow in Paris at 3. Our rugby coverage brought to you by Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. I wanted to put it out to our listeners as well. Were you happy with the performance against Scotland last weekend, 5-3-106? How patient are you with Andy Farrell and the players? Who would you like to see in the team that isn't in the team? And what about the style of play so far from Ireland? Now, lads, where do we think the key levels of improvement need to be from the Scotland game to today? Johnny, start with you. Um, I think that the you know last week there was bits of, of stuff on the pitch. I think you can look at the, the try they scored, uh, you know the kind of little wrap out the back of that, so close to the the uh, to the try line. Usually, you know under Joe Smith it was very much get up, get round the corner and try and beat them up. There was a lot less subtlety uh, than was shown, and even in that one instance, I think that's what you can show that Mike Cat is already starting to bring a, a, a subtle little play so close to the line. Um, that drags in defenders and, the, and they score. I think it will happen over time. Um, you know, Ireland were, were played a, a certain style for so long. You have to kind of come back to the start and then, and then move forward. So um, I think it will happen and it will expand over a period of time. Um, but I, I would be pretty positive about where they where they could get to. It was never a case that he was going to come in, uh, Andy Farrell and Mike Hatt were going to come in and just throw everyone out and start again and accept that uh, you know there might be losses and blood loads of new players. International rugby doesn't really work like that. It's you know there's a Six Nations on the line and and. You know, an opportunity to to win them doesn't come around very often, but you know, I, I think it will. Um, we'll see every game. We'll see a progression. Now, the conditions, I suppose, everyone would have prepared for a very physical battle today, a physically orientated battle with a lot of kicking based on the forecast that was given. But seems to be that you know there there could be a bit of ball play today. Hopefully, we might just miss the storm, uh, Rory. Uh, has the performance against Scotland aged better for you over the week than it was at first sight last weekend? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, I thought the intent was there, the execution was off and I thought they um, they tried things that they may not have tried in the past and I think that's one of the things we've called for over the last year or so is, is that they, they at least move the ball a bit wider, that they try and counter-attack a bit more and you can't really hammer them when that doesn't come off. You, you, know, you want them to tighten it up. I think they've, they've a couple of simple fixes that they can put in place to make it a lot t- a lot, a lot better this week. One is the scrum. Um, I think Poppy being referee instead of Reynal is, is, is definitely going to be an improvement because it was an absolute free-for-all last week in, in many aspects, in particular the scrum. It's not often Keane Healy gives away two scrum penalties. If they can get parity or even get a bit of dominance there, it makes life easier for Johnny Sexton and Conor Murray. Um, I think they need to win. They need they need to get them all going. If they can get them all going, it just gives them. It ties in a lot of defenders. It gives them a bit more space to work with. Um, and I think their work in contact needs to be an awful lot better because Scotland bullied them, and that should that should be a sore. They should be sore after that o- over the course of the week. They, you know, Scotland winning winning all the dominant collisions probably should have resulted in Scotland winning the game if they taken their chances. That shouldn't happen at the Viva Stadium. And that should be a major point that Andy Farrell's been hammering home all week. It's just whether Ireland have the bodies to do it. I mean, 
You know, I, I don't particularly like to blend to that back row. I'm not a huge fan of the centre partnership either, but they're all good players. I just don't think they're, they're think they're slightly, you know, as as combinations, they're they're all a bit little bit little bit blunt. So I, that's where my concern would lie. But you know, if they can give Jordan Armour a bit more support and counter attack, if they can get the ball in his hands a bit more in open play, they have the weapons to hurt Wales. So Johnny, do we need to be a bit more angry? Um, yeah, I think the, the physical fight in the ground is, is something that definitely needs to um, to move forward in terms of your ball presentation. And I suppose that was something that Joe Smith really did revolutionise, um, was the breakdown and, and how, how it was attacked. So, um, you know, to win a game losing a lot of the, the collisions and the gain line all the time in attack is... is <laughs> is actually a really good result at, at, at this level. So that's a positive to, to start. And um, I think if they can get uh, a, a bit more quick ball uh, and, and run a few more soft shoulders, get your con- get your footwork going clo- uh, close quarters, get to a soft shoulder, that'll create a quicker ball, which will enable you to move the ball more. It'll be easier to move it to width. They are set up in a different way that they have a bit more width in their overall um, you know, multi-phase game with, with guys not necessarily chasing the breakdown. So it's, um, you know, the positives are there, but it, it, for it all to work will take time. Um, you know, I, I think I'd be a massive fan of of my cat and in what he's done and where he's been, even from his player coach days as um, a London Irish. Um, you know, I, I played in that final that they lost. He was 40 year old playing at 10, but he was also doing uh, doing all their attack, and they were a really, really good side. And he's just developed. You know, he's a top, top class coach, and I think it is going to be exciting. But it's not going to happen within you know two weeks of him being there. It, it could take two years, you know, and that's the reality of of, of international rugby. Rory, Conor Murray, does he need a night out of ten performance to keep the John Cooney clamour and pressure off his shoulders? I don't know. I think I think at this stage people have almost drawn lines in the sand and they're team team Murray or team Cooney. So I think he probably needs to block out the public the public discussion. Andy it's Farris, team Ewan. Uh, I would I would have picked. I'm not I'm not going to um, entrench myself, but I would have gone for for John Cooney for both of these games personally. Um, Andy Farrell has put himself firmly in the in the Murray camp. He's, he's he knows him very well. He's worked with him on Lions tours. He's worked with him in Ireland for a year, for a couple of years. He knows how good he can be. But I think if Ireland want to be the team they want to be, or they know they can be, they need Conor Murray firing and playing at the world class levels that are that Ireland know he can get to. And he hasn't been that player since he got injured in 20, uh, 2018. Um, I mean, there is an up like a steady uptick in his performances. I think I think he like. He needs to maybe hurry up the box six a little bit, stop trying to draw penalties offside, just hurry up the game. But I do think that Andy Farrell might have kind of, you know, Joe Schmidt had John Cooney on the bench throughout last year's Six Nations, dropped him for the Wales game, but didn't bring him on until about five minutes to go in every game. I think Farrell showed a bit of intent when he brought him on with 20 minutes to go last week. And, and Cooney does bring something different and, you know, will ask different questions of Wales. And, you know, it's a good compromise to have, you know, Murray steady the ship for, for, for 60 minutes or, or so and run the game well alongside Johnny Sexton in that familiar combination. And then you bring on the confidence of, of Cooney to maybe have a snipe to kind of bring, bring a different kick game to bring a different dy- dynamic to the game so I think if it, it did work you know to a degree last week although the game did get to, get away from Ireland towards the end of the game they ended up defending for a long time but um, I think it's not a bad compromise it, it, it could work out quite well. Johnny is it time to move away from box kicking I'll just quote Brian Driscoll from during the week if you get 60% of your box kicks back and you get possession from it people will get over their disappointment of kicking the ball away whereas I don't know what the stats are looking like but it feels like we're getting 25 to 30 percent of them back at a push and that's not a good enough return for kicking possession away. Uh, no it's not. Um, you know, I think Ireland would, would pride themselves uh, on that competition in the air and being able to win that the majority of the time and you know uh, in, in reality it, it, it's an old phrase but a bad kick can be turned, go- can be turned into a good one purely based by a by, by the standard of its kick chase, um, and that's probably something that, that that is letting them down. Guys are getting up, but it's it's the scraps on the ground that they're not winning, and and teams are loading up there now, so they know how reliant we are in terms of our exits on on our um, on our kick on on our box kicks. But it's um, so that that should create space somewhere else. There is always going to be space. It's just how you find it. So box kicking like that is good, it, 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 and it is a needs must sometimes. But 
two things. If you're going to kick out, it has to go out. If you're going to kick contestable, it has to be contestable. And you have to you have to turn the percentages in your favour. So if it's a 50-50, you have to manage it that it actually becomes a 60-40 towards you. And that's what um, they would have done and, and they'll continue to try to do. But it's also now being able to see the space that is created by the teams holding an extra man back, getting their blockers in, in, in place and stopping our, our chase getting up in the air that means there is going to be space somewhere else so it's to be able to take that and also I think now there is going to be a freedom for the players on the pitch to take it so sometimes and um, you know you're hearing stuff that's slowly starting to come out rightly or wrongly that if someone does go off did go off script in the previous six or seven years and it didn't come off it was what are you doing stick to script where I think there's probably now a more within uh, the environment and you know my cat teams are very much okay well take it if it doesn't work grand but at least you saw the space and we'll manage that next time we'll make sure that we execute it next time and I think that's probably the ultimate um, difference um, in in probably playing styles um, and that's not that's not necessarily criticism it's just a, a stylistic difference I think there's um, John there's a uh, also uh, they have to manage the crowd a little bit as well and when you're at home when you're at home you want you know the crowd to be on the other team's back not on your back and every mm. time they was box it flat kick, last week lads was it flat I, well, it, it was okay at the start, but it, once they went to the box kick, they the basically sucked the entire life out of the stadium. Yeah, yeah. And it was almost like the entire crowd groaned. And it was a bit unfair because it was slow ball, and Conor Murray was probably making the right decision for the team. Um, you know, in his own half, slow ball, you know, get it up the pitch. I think Stockdale could help him out an awful lot. I think he like he needs to start playing like a six foot four winger and start being more aggressive in the air. I think mm. he. You know, if he needs to learn from Andrew Conway, who's a lot smaller than him, but wins a lot more ball in the air. Probably one of the smallest wingers around, but he actually wins and a lot of his so collisions hard. in the air and, and, and wins a lot of ball in air that he, he shouldn't, based on his size, just by purely a will and a want to get up and, and turn that 50-50 into a 60-40 for him. Welcome to success, lads. That was what success does. You win three Six Nations titles, you win a Grand Slam, you beat New Zealand in Chicago and in Dublin, you're ranked number one in the world, you flop at the World Cup, People are now impatient. I don't think it's right that they're impatient, but they're just impatient. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, that's the yeah, I, I, yeah, pretty much. It, it is quite Irish, but that's that's. You know, there is an expectation. We've got on, crazy on expectations team. in this country around sporting teams. The Republic of Ireland team, the rugby team, even our own Gaelic counties. It's mad. Yeah, it is. You're right, but you know, I, I think it's. Uh, you also have to complement uh, the teams, the the teams that have done it to, to put us on that to put on, on that pedestal. Um, and sometimes there does need to be a bit of a reality check that um, you know it's okay. We're not going to win every game. Performances sometimes good teams have to win ugly, which they did last week. And um, you know, I think that's probably you know there is a, a you're you're dead right in that, and and we do need a bit of a, a pinch every now and again. Going okay, we're competing very well here, but um, we need to make sure that I, I think there's also probably a, a frustration annoyance that we we somehow manage not from a rugby perspective we somehow keep managing not to peak at the right times. I think that's probably the most frustrating thing from the rugby supporting public that and there is. I think they're probably a small bit annoyed about it more than than, than anything else now at this stage. There's 12 of that team were part of the this, the Grand Slam campaign two years ago, um, and the New Zealand win that that unbelievable level of consistency. So I mean I think people are right to expect that they can get close to that level on a regular basis. You know they set a standard that year that they're not hitting themselves. So for all the fans of expectation, I'm sure they have that expectation I internally do, them, yeah. themselves. You know, yeah. and their confidence is obviously taking a hit. Some of them maybe are a little bit over the hill, and they haven't been moved on by Andy Farrell. So that's that's his challenge. He's given them one more. Like this, is, I think for a lot of these players, this is kind of a, not a last chance, but it's a bit of a kind of you know sh shape up or ship out because he has players hungry to get into the team in the squad. I mean, you look at Chris Farrell, Stuart McCluskey, yeah. a couple of you know Max Deeg and Caelan Doris. You know, there's a couple of players coming through that can really that that, could, that will justifiably feel that they should be out there. So I do think that the, that class of 2018, who were so so good, have set that expectation themselves, and if they continue to fall below those standards at some stage they're going to have to be moved on. Mm. 53106 for your text, folks. Is there too much expectation on this Irish rugby team at the moment? We've got a coach who's just come in. We have a Six Nations. We're building maybe towards a World Cup in 2023, although I do think that the cycles are too long and we just need to really concentrate on what's ahead of us this year, especially with the seedings and the, the rankings have been so important after November. And we haven't even mentioned Wales yet. Um, 
funny enough, no Warren Gatland this year, Warren Pivak coming in, um, sorry, Wayne Pivak. I'm, 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 I'm so ingrained with Warren Gatland in my head for like the last 20 years that I'm calling Wayne Pivak, Warren Pivak. But uh, what is the Warren P the Wayne Pivak way? I very much how, how Scarlets play. Uh, Scarlets played when they won the, the, the Pro 14. Uh, they like to, to move the ball. They, they play a, a similar kind of basic system to a lot of teams in a 1-3-2. 3-1 system but they do like to, to shift the ball a lot um, and move the point of contact as much as possible um, he would be very much similar on the long lines of my cat in terms of space you know space creation and seeing where the space is and trying to move the ball to it um, and I think again that is a that is a different style to what Warren Gatlin uh, played so uh, probably a return to probably the pre, you know the historic Welsh way of playing rugby in terms of similar enough to the French UA kind of style you, you look to play and, and the running rugby um, that the Welsh sides you know previously had so um, I think that's his style um, again you didn't see it I know it was a dirty day over there last but like it was very much it wasn't that free falling style that you saw last you know last week that was not necessarily his style either so that'll take time to put put in but they would be you know they're a very dangerous side they're you know they have a, a lot of consistency in in um you know in selection um and you know you've got form guys like uh, you know nick top nick tompkins coming in the saracens 13 who played very well off the bench last week um you know so they're a they're a serious serious outfit rory i think wales have been grossly underestimated in the betting six to four against Maybe it's because they're away from home, but they're going for nine wins in their row now in the Six Nations Grand Slam champions. To me, they're very dangerous. Oh yeah, they're more than dangerous. I can't believe those odds. I've yeah, I been looking at them all week and, and not really understanding where where the bookies are coming from. I know that this game has tended in the recent years to go with the home team, but I mean, this is a team that held Ireland scoreless for 83 minutes in last year's Six Nations. I mean, they're justify. You know, they were deserved Grand Slam champions. They were they were the best team in the tournament last year. They had a good World Cup. I think if they'd been able to keep a few more bodies on side, they, they, they would have ran, like they ran South Africa really close with a kind of a, a tired squad. Now, I was there that night. It didn't, it never, even though they got right in the mix in the end and it took, you know, it took that lot, those late penalties to, to win it, it, I never really believed that Wales were going to get to that final and I really don't know where, if, how they would perform in the final because they looked like a team on their last legs. But, I mean, they are the form team. They have a huge pedigree. They, they've, They've even strengthened almost. I know they've lost Jonathan Davies, but I think Talibu Falatao is one of the best number eights in the world, and we've almost forgotten about him. I mean, I didn't really appreciate how good he was until I went on the 2017 Lions tour and watched him at close hands throughout that tour. He is a class, class number eight, mm. and he, he'll give Wales way more at that position than, CJ, than Arlen McGuinness or CJ Stander, who I think is a six playing at eight. Yeah, and I so I, I, I think they've strengthened it. I think they've got a full, full court game. I just wonder whether you know Ireland will be able to beat them up up front. But then we always kind of assume Ireland will be able to do that, and they're not always able to do it. Yeah, their, their scrum wasn't at the best, as you said earlier on, Rory. Roman Poit is going to be very important today in that sphere. He is, yeah. And he, like uh, the, the narrative around Roman Poit is that he, he kind of rewards the team who gets on top early. So there's a lot of pressure on Keane Healy and Tyg Furlong, and then the, the scrummaging locks behind them to, to get the get the nudge on and you know paint a picture that that the Poit will continue to see throughout the game. It, you know, it, Wales. Used to, like under Gatland, they used to, I think, hit and chase quite a lot. They used to kind of cheat their way through it, which, you know, if you get away with it, it's not cheating. It's, it's, it's pretty good stuff. But they've always had... Their props have never been as good as Ireland's props. I think they have a couple of new guys who are, who are a bit better at, at the moment, but still would not maybe have the, be of the class of, of Healy and, and mm -hmm. Furlong. And then you've got Kilcoyne and Porter won't, won't weaken things at all coming off the bench. It should be an area of real strength. But then you've got Rob Herring coming in for Rory Best, who was, you know, renowned as being a really, really strong scrummaging, uh, scrummaging hooker, which is a, it's hard to gauge how good your hooker is at scrummaging from the outside. But the way they talked about him was always very strong that way. And um, Herring's a lighter, more kind of, more party around the park kind of player, you know. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's been a bit of a loss there, or a bit of a readjustment. So, yeah, but I think there is scope for Ireland to get on top in that area. And if they can get their mall working as well, if they can win the tight five battle, they'll have gone a long way. But the back row lads, Wayne Rice, Tapuric and um, Faletau, have they got a better balance, as you were saying there? Is that a real worry for Ireland? Especially all of the match winners, the man of the match winners last weekend in the first round of the Six Nations were back row players. Yeah, I, I, I really like the, the, um, you know, the, the Welsh back row. I think Justin uh, Tupric has probably been in Sam Warburton's um, shadow for years, but he's as good a player. Um, you know, he was forced to be six, and, you know, he's a, he's a lion himself. 
Um, I would think that internationally he's he's very much an underrated uh, seven. I think he's top top quality, and when. Uh, the Ospreys were at the, at their top level. He was functioning extremely high in the, in that back row. Um, you know, I, I think Rory's already spoken about uh, Faletau, top class. And and uh, just to reiterate what Rory said, I I do think CJ's best uh, best position is six, and and we do lack um, you know that out and out number eight probably since Jamie Jamie has retired. Um, Would and, Wales have played Max Deegan? Would they be adventurous enough to do that? Um, I'm not too sure, and they have the, the you know the likes of Falatau there already. You no, know, and the Irish team I mean. and Ross Mariotti. Yeah, like I, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I think it has to be done solely. I suppose you know Keelan Darris was was the the big hope last week, and I was so unfortunate that he came off so early. So. Um, you know, I think the balance will be found later on in the game, um, and the game's probably going to be in the melting pot when Max Deegan comes on. So I think that in itself is probably a big show of, um, you know, confidence in him because, you know, sometimes you know, in a tight game, coming off the bench can be very, very hard to find your um, find your level straight off. Um, you know, with 20, 50, 20 minutes, 15 minutes to come on when he's in, and it's only going to be a one score game. So, that in itself, for a young player coming off the bench, is a massive show of confidence. It's always easier, probably, to start your first cap just because you get it over, get it done, and where you have, you know, on the bench, he's going to have. 50, 60, 65 minutes waiting and the nerves are going to be built as the as the atmosphere gets greater and the, the collisions and he's hearing them and he's seeing them. So um, that for me, I think, is a big show of confidence in, in his capabilities. Um, and that balance will help towards the end of the game. Josh Adams, 10 tries and 8 tests. How do we keep him quiet? Um, I think our defensive system, um, that is the one thing that is very... You know, has been a constant. Um, you know, it, Andy Farrell has been in charge of that over the last number of years. He's still in charge of it, and I think it's, um, you know, the, the the way Ireland defend is based on uh, repeated efforts, high line speed, um, and leaving last man, which is um, which is a bit of a gamble, but you back yourself to stop the ball, and I think that's um, that's the big thing when you stop the ball. It's very hard for an attacking team to get the ball to wit. Um, but when you allow them and you don't push through and believe and keep pushing through on your system, then they can get the ball to wit, and that's when you're when, when you're in trouble. So, um, you know, a, a team like Ireland, um, if they manage to get them, allow uh, space on the edge and don't shut it down, then it's you know you can be in trouble because you can get back to the middle very easily that's when your your defensive line is severed in the middle of the park you've got two lines to come forward where you want them to go to wit in a sense that grant but we're going to mark that space we'll win the collision out wide it looks like you're playing rugby when you're actually not that again line is we've won the gain line battle and then they soak you up with a load of pressure coming off that edge um but um when you do create space uh, and they sever you out wide it, it becomes very hard so it's a kind of risk reward situation in there but you know they they will back themselves to shut that down and and, and not allow Josh Adams and George North Lee Halfpenny that space uh, on the edge 55 minutes gone in the Premier League it's now Everton won Crystal Palace won Christian Benteke scored for Palace they've scored a goal in the Premier League can you believe it uh, one all there and James McCarthy and Seamus Coleman on opposite sides of the pitch today. Uh, Rory, you were saying there about the centre partnership. Obviously, Gary Ringrose is injured. Are you worried we lack a bit of an X factor there? Yeah, I am a little bit. I mean, I, I like both Bundiaki and Robbie Henshaw at 12. I think that, you know, they're, you could toss a coin between the two of them to start in that position. But I think when you put them together, you lose some of that backline creativity. And uh, we didn't realise on Monday that, that uh, Will Addison was was out of the game. I, you know, I would have called for him to be in the team. I really like. I think if you if you don't have ring rolls, he's probably the closest Ireland have got. But I think I do think Chris Farrell possibly offers a little bit more in terms of passing game than Robbie Henshaw. Maybe that's being unfair on Henshaw. He has played 13, you know, a lot, and he probably he he, he would tell you he's a better footballer than, than he's been allowed to be in the Ireland jersey over the last couple of years, but. You know, he's been in that position for an awful long time. He's, he's run into a lot of brick walls, Robbie Henshaw, and I'm not sure if he's as fast or, is, or, is, or you know, he's been given the licence this, in this team to, to pass the ball as much as, as you, you know, and maybe, like, you know, I'm not sure now that he's kind of had that role for so long if he's able to do it. Maybe he'll come out and prove me wrong today. He's up against, you know, um, Tompkins, who's a very good player, but he's never, you know, he's never faced opposition like this at this level before, you know. He's, he's not a... 
you know he wouldn't have been a frontliner at, at Saracens, but you know b before this season. So there is a, a chance for Henshaw to really assert his class over over a newcomer and really give him a good welcome to Test rugby. Um, but I do fear that Ireland will become a bit blunt with that centre partnership. That you know there's big threats in that back three. You know Conway's having a brilliant season, Larmer's sensational, and, and Stockdale is a brilliant finisher. They need to get the ball into those players' hands, and and you know why. I'm just not sure if the Aki and, and Henshaw have the capabilities to get it, get it out to them. I think they'll often t choose the direct route when it's on. And, and well, you know, Andy Farrell actually said last week they went wide too often and they should have gone a bit more direct. I would like to see them, you know, get it out there a bit. But they'll win a lot of collisions. They will supplement. I think Ireland's back or Ireland's uh, back row is a little light on collision winners. I think that the centres will make up for that a bit. So if it does, if the conditions do come in and it does end up being a bit more of a slugfest, they won't be found wanting in that regard. 53106 for your text. We've got Bob Morgan in touch to say, hard to see past Wales. I'd be happy with a visible improvement and a more expansive game. Uh, another one on, I'm Irish and nervous. Andy Farrell needs time, but I just wanted to turn up and give it a real go. Give it a lash. Back to the Mick Doyle days. And Tom Kelly in touch on 53106. Boring, boring Ireland. We'll try and bore Wales into submission. But if it's worth a one-point win, it might be enough right now. Half an hour to kick off. Johnny, you see nothing out in the pitch there? Andy Farrell out there in his suit yet? Yeah, he's out there in his suit. Everyone else is all uh, in their tracksuits, so it's unusual. And I'm not sure if you watch the cameras, uh, the player cam of him last week, or the coach cam, if you want to call him that, in the snippets. I'm not sure how comfortable he is in in, in the suit. Uh, I don't think he's, uh, you know, I don't think he's a, a suit man in that Burn kind the of suit. Stuff, you know, uh, <laughs> he's more of a, a, you know, he's more of a coach. Uh, you know, being in the, uh, being right in the in the thick of things. So. Um, but yeah, look, that that's his job now, and uh, um, yeah, look, I, I'm I'm very excited about uh, about where this uh, this whole um, you know th this whole coaching setup can go, and and the, and the coaches within within the Irish structure now. You know, there's um, you know, and you even see it from the guys uh, in terms of their media stuff. They're a bit more open. It's a bit more relaxed. You know, there was videos and and photographs of them. Um, you know, signing autographs when they arrive first for uh, walking out the tunnel, and then there's a picture of them in in that huddle in the middle park. That, rightly or wrongly, that didn't happen last time. You know, that didn't happen under the previous uh, uh, regime. And I'm not, uh, like, I'm not, I'm not giving out about it. I'm just saying there, there seems to be a bit more relaxation in it. And you know, listen to Andrew Conway during the week. Um, you know, talk about the the selection early, about being able to settle into things and and have those conversations early. You know, Joe probably did um, did name his team. I'd say he, he did name his team on Tuesday, but it was trying to keep it quiet he that the lads, yeah, anyway, trying yeah. That, that the lads were like, you know, they go home to their families on Tuesday night and they're back in on Wednesday and be like, you know, are you playing? Oh, I don't, I don't know. And I often had those conversations with the lads or my mates that still be playing. Oh, are you playing? Ah, oh, I'm hopeful. I'm like, right, okay, I'm not even going to ask anymore. <laughs> you know, and I think that's that just creates a bit more relaxation w around what is. Uh, a tough week publicly because they're under such scrutiny and, and that uh, that scrutiny of, of uh, you know and that expectation that you've already spoken about John that's on them and, and the lads do feel that you know they, they, anyone that says they don't feel that is, is probably lying to a certain extent you know it is there and, and they know it's there yeah, I think this is a massive day for them I, like I think if you win today you've basically given yourself you've achieved your Six Nations goal because they'll beat Italy in, in three or four weeks yeah. time They've got a free hit against England and, and France away from home. Yeah. They could win the Six Nations if they fell short but gave a good effort in those two games. I don't think anyone's going to hold it against them in the first season. Yeah. I think if you've got to win your home games against, against Wales and Scotland. That's why there's such pressure this week. I think if they, if they can get over the line today, I think, re to be honest, regardless of the performance, you obviously want to see them expand things a little bit. But I think today is all about winning. It gives Farrell a bit of breathing space. It gives the team a little bit more um, room to breathe. It means you, you make a few, few more changes. You don't want to be going to tweaking them on the back foot. You don't want two weeks of scrutiny about you know, what went wrong against Wales. I do think this is a really pivotal game. If he can get eight points from those first two games, it just means that he, he separated himself from the old from the old. He set things up for a new and yeah. he can go into the rest of twenty twenty. Um 
almost not quite with a free hit, but with a bit more leeway. I think yeah. it just re relaxes the whole thing. I think this is basically the key game in the entire calendar year. Not to put too much pressure on them, yeah. but I do think that this just opens things up nicely for them if they can win today. Scotland will gain a lot of confidence from last week. I thought they were very good, apart from their finishing. Mm. Uh, would you give them a shot against England today, Cock of a Cup match? I would, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I think England were... Um, were disappointing um, and especially you know the language and the terminology that was used throughout the week about you know um, you know I think actually he used the word Eddie Jones used the word violence and um, brutality. And, and brutality and that kind of stuff and, and they they very much lacked that uh, in spades and I think it was I think everyone needs to be very wary of France now because Sean Edwards has gone in there and who is the furthest from a French man that you'll ever meet. Um, and he is going to be shouting and roaring and bawling lads out of it to make sure that the line speed that they bring in defence is what he wants it to be. And after a first game, you would say the French players and the French people have accepted that and they've done it. I think that's probably um, a worrying thing because overall, you know, some people would have... That probably... It looks like it's been a great signing, but it could have been a dreadful signing because the French players might have just gone here. Who's this fellow well, from couldn't the get north any worse, of England? Could yeah, who's this fellow from the north of England shouting at me all the time? Yeah. Like I'm not into this at all. But they seem to have bought into it, and that's. I think everyone needs to be afraid of that. You know, I, I think. I think we've maybe underestimated the World Cup final hangover that England have. I mean, that's a career low for nearly all of those players. A week yeah. after their career high. You know, they've loads of Saracens players who are probably onto their agents every day wondering what's happening. Who, yeah. you know, probably have suffered such kind Even of. Even in the last 24 hours, Rory, was absolutely. Still yeah, I mean, what's, what sort of preparation is that? You're wondering about that game. I mean, you see Lewis Ludlam come out this week talking about hating Scotland. I mean, you know, that's just city stuff, and you just wonder if they're trying to work themselves into something that, they, that isn't there, you know? Yeah. I mean, can they get up for Six Nations after going so well in the World Cup? It's, it's still part of the same season. I think France, because they've jett jettisoned so many of the players, are probably the only team without any sort of World Cup hangover. Well, yeah. Probably felt came back from Japan feeling pretty good about themselves. Ireland are still, I think, dealing with the with the fallout. Scotland are almost reacting to it and the Finn Russell thing. Mm. So like, England don't really win their away games that well, and um, or that, that much over the last couple of years. I know the World Cup was on neutral ground, but they, you know they've they've lost they've lost to Murrayfield two years ago, and, and 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 Scotland were very good that day. You know Russell will be a lot remiss. I mean, I heard Stuart Barnes talking about during the week that. He, uh, Russell, you know, England are so structured that, for, you know, Russell's capacity to throw something out from nowhere just completely unsettles them. Hastings possibly doesn't have that, but I think I give Scotland the right good go to yeah, get a chance so, today yeah. um, at, at home. And suddenly Eddie Jones, I mean, he's already Kieran Bracken's already come out calling for his head. Maybe trying to get a, bit of, a few bigger numbers for his new podcast, but um, Ooh. if they, yeah, Ooh, Rory. yeah, well, I'm a cynic, you know, I've always been a cynic. Um, but if, if they, uh, you know, there'll be a few more voices joining that clamour. You know, three, they've lost two in a row now. Um, it'd be interesting going to Twickenham if England lost their first two exactly. games. Exactly, <laughs> and like a thing, you go there with a free shot, and you can very much play up it, it, into that. You go there with the pressure on you after losing at home to Wales. It's a different ball game because the siege mentality kicks in in that space, and you're like, okay, well. You know where, where are they going to go? So where you could go there with a free shot, pressure's off, right? We win this. England are in a dreadful space. Yeah, and then uh, Ireland will go to Paris yeah. with the title on the line. So yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it, again. I think just today is this is moving day. I think for this year's Six Nations. I mean, this is the yeah. day where we kind of establish who are the contenders and who, who's probably going to be playing for third and fourth spots. Yeah. Okay, lads. Uh, go at Goodison Park. It's Everton now leading Crystal Palace. Paul Anthony. It's Everton 1, Crystal Palace 1 and Palace back in the game early in this second half. A through ball through to Christian Benteke. He raced through one-on-one -on -one with Pickford and slotted it underneath him and into the bottom corner. It's Everton 1, Crystal Palace 1. Well, I can tell you actually they've gone 2-1 up for Charleston with the goal there for the Toffee. So Everton 2, Crystal Palace 1 in the Premier League. Uh, we got a late change to the Welsh bench. Jared Evans has replaced Owen Williams on the bench. Williams picking up an injury in the warm-up. Uh, just an interesting story, Rory, the back of the... Daily Mail today about South Africa joining the Six Nations. Is there any legs in this in your view? Yes, I think I think the whole ground upon what rugby, you know, on which rugby is built, is shifting beneath us at the moment. Um, we saw yesterday Six Nations basically align themselves for a kind of a one big TV deal to be sold off with the under twenties, the women's, and the November internationals. Um, 
I think we're probably going to see the game realigned among, you know, from northern northern to southern, sorry, from northern and southern hemispheres as it is now to a more east-west yeah, more divide, timelines, yeah. and more timelines. I think South Africa fit more neatly into the northern hemisphere game like that. I think they they much prefer to be playing up here. London's a massive market for them. They may even play a home game in Wembley or something along those lines. I mean, that's a long way down the line. Um, so I think maybe we need to enjoy these uh, these Six Nations games while they're still here because I think once you bring a seventh team in, maybe you bring an eighth team in for somewhere else, you start thinking about structures, you, you, you lose the, yeah. do you go four and four, do you lose the, the annual only... game against Wales? I think all this is yeah. on the table and I think people need to get out start thinking about it because if you don't like it now's the time to try and stop it yeah the only thing that I, I would like about it is that they could go seven teams for one year and yeah. then have a relegation system where you're up and down that yes. would make that would be a brilliant competition and I would also open up you know um you know, Romania, Georgia, you know, Italy would have to be really competitive. They'd have to win games every year to, to get back up. It would create a, a ver for me, it would be a much more um, inclusive, European inclusive way, probably the European timeline uh, inclusive way and, and give uh, lower, uh, lower rated nations an opportunity to get in. Now, if they did get in, they'd have to be competitive. That would be the only thing for me, you know, that, uh, but also if, you were in a in a, a wooden spoon playoff to get relegated, and you did win. You'd be thinking, well, you won that playoff, then you probably are good enough to be in, and uh, and that would be. Uh, I'd love. I wouldn't mind seeing it that way. I'm not saying I'd love to see it, but I wouldn't mind seeing it that way. Kind of conferences and movement stuff around. I wouldn't be mad on now, to be honest. Yeah, like the way I'm kind of looking at this, guys. They, they, what they're going to do is they're going to centralise the pool uh, regarding broadcast deals. So the Six Nations, the Women's Six Nations, the Autumn Internationals, they're going to sell all of the rights together for the next rights deal, which will be after 2022. BBC and ITV have the bulk of the share regarding the Six Nations at the moment. Will the Irish rugby public be accepting of Six Nations going off terrestrial television? from a public interest and a participatory basis, is it a worry that there's likes of private equity companies coming into the game and then eventually the Six Nations could go off terrestrial TV? Or is that just the way it's going? Well, I think that's the way, it's the way professional sport has gone. Yeah, I don't necessarily think sport. it's the way it should go. Yeah. Um, I think you look at the you know, Heineken Champions Cup on BT, you know, it, I don't think it gets the same level of interest. I mean, I, I certainly noticed in those weeks that I, you know, there's not as much reaction. People don't know necessarily what time games are on. I do think you lose that mass market appeal that the Six Nations have. I mean. We, you know, last week we were in, in the studio, John, talking about you know our Six Nations memories. I think there is this is the one time rugby raises itself above the parapet as, as a kind of a national sport, as you know, with the World Cup as well, where it becomes a part of the national sporting conversation. And I think if you risk losing that if you go behind a paywall, at the same time, the RFU and all the other unions, I mean, the RFU are actually probably better set than, than some of the rival unions. Yeah. Um, they need to pay the bills, they need to pay these players and keep them in Ireland. So they're, there's a risk-reward element, but I do think, you know, I think English cricket is the, the classic example of a sport that went, you know, has loads of money but doesn't have that many people interested in it because it's all on Sky and it's not it's behind a paywall. Yeah, and like when I was in England, cricket is a pri prime example. Like, you go to, a, uh, you know, you go down to Grace Road in Leicestershire, you go to a, a four-day game, and literally there's about 12 people there yeah. you go on a Friday night to a 2020 game and it is rammed yeah. um, and I think that's that's the kind of the comparison and something that different you know different audiences have to be and have to appeal but that's professional sport ultimately professional sport is is not just a sport in reality it's a business and the business needs to make money and the people running it they want to make money like any other business and that's the that's the reality but, of sport but they got to be long you know they got to be thinking long term as well because in this fragmenting kind of media landscape with you know if they sell it to a, a small broadcaster no one can watch you know when the rights come around in five ten years time maybe they won't be as lucrative no so they got it, it, they yeah. got to be careful i think but you know they've, they've sold they're selling a, par a portion of the rights to cbc capital and investment firm who've already bought into the Pro 14 and, and, and in the Premiership. So they're possibly, possibly going to align the season a bit better, which, you know, they may, may, may be unlikely saviours for the game. Well, but, it, you know, they're going to want bang for their book. All, yeah. I, all I can say is Formula One, uh, the worldwide audience sell by 137 million yeah. after after went behind the paywall. Uh, money, money, money. It does, uh, yeah, I know what we're saying, lads, uh, and I know what's happening in all professional sports, especially in football, but I'm just a little bit worried about it. Yeah. From from a, from the health of, of even society, uh, but that's like a, we could have a, another four hour debate about, about, about that another day. Like the pressing thing now is that two fifteen Ireland play Wales in the Six Nations. Johnny Murphy and Rory O'Connor. Uh, just some text in here. Matt Barkley, 
Wales 28, Ireland 17. So he's going for Wales. Ireland to win today. They go to Twickenham looking for the Triple Crown. That's from Paddy and Cork. We forget about Triple Crowns these days uh, with our success in recent years of the Championship of the Grand Slam in 2018. Lads, Leinster dominate most of these Welsh players on a regular basis. In fact, they're in a different league to Welsh clubs. Given that Ireland is dominated by Leinster players and the Welsh don't have Gatlin anymore, surely confidence should be high. I'd say call Lancaster for help. Lads today, who, why and by how many? Uh, I'm going to go uh, Ireland by six. I went for Ireland by one in this morning's paper, so I better stick by that, but I do it with absolutely no confidence. Um, <laughs> I think this, this, this is one of those games that's going to swing on what happens out there. And I, I think these teams are so evenly matched. Um, Wales are in better form, but Ireland at home, just to edge it. Rory O'Connor, thanks so much. And Johnny Murphy will have regular updates from you from Lansdowne Road throughout the afternoon. Ireland against Wales and the Six Nations. Right on off the ball here, Saturday on News Talk, 53106, the number for your text messages. Back to pave the road to Tokyo by speaking to two of our hockey stars, Nikki Evans and Lena Tice, after the news. Following this break, Everton leading Crystal Palace 2-1 in the Premier League. Stay with us. Off the ball.